I'm Ernie Bauer with the CSIS Southeast Asia program, and I'm here today with Vietnam's ambassador to the United States, Lei Kong Fong. Thank you for joining us, Ambassador. I'd like to ask you a couple questions about uh, uh, Vietnam and, and Vietnam's very strong leadership of, of ASEAN over the last year. Uh, you just chaired ASEAN, uh, Vietnam chaired ASEAN, uh, of course, uh, in 2010. And Vietnam contributed just an enormous amount to the to the dynamism of, of ASEAN. Could you talk a little bit about what you thought were the key accomplishments of Vietnam's year of, of chairing, and, and what was Vietnam's strategy uh, for leading ASEAN? Uh, this time, the second time that Vietnam chaired the ASEAN, since we entered this association in 1985. It is not an easy job, I think, but uh, thanks to the support from the ASEAN colleagues and from the dialogue partners, we have, I think, successfully acting as a chair of the ASEAN Association. Uh, it is an association, and our principle is based on the consensus idea and consensus agreement in any time and any issue or problem that we, the ASEAN countries, involved in discussion. Uh, but we have been in the year trying to heighten the spirit of ASEAN. Primarily, we try our best to make the ASEAN country and all the activities of the country to push forward the ASEAN chapter and to build up effectively the ASEAN Association. At the same time, we also try to deepen and broaden the relation with the dialogue partners, particularly the East Asia partners, and outside like the U.S., Russia, India, and some other countries. We think if we want to be a successful chair, we had to also heighten and consolidate the central role of ASEAN. And trying to do what the ASEAN states and ASEAN people expect us to do. That is to continue pushing ahead the development, economic development, social development in the region, trying to fill the gap between the developing and developed country in the association. We are also trying, and I think in this field is a very successful one, that is to strengthen the security and stability in the region, trying to work together with the dialogue partners, the ASEAN tree are trying to, let's say, make the people be secure in the region. And besides that, we concentrate on the rising issue like the maritime security, the conflicts or disputes in the region, how to solve it, how to tackle it, in order to maintain the development and also maintain the security and stability in the region. What, um, you know, you certainly had a great advance this year, which was, uh, to many of us who have watched ASEAN develop, I'm surprised that the ASEAN uh, defense ministers could already get together and agree on an ASEAN defense ministers meeting plus eight. Um, why was that important to, to Vietnam? To, is it a new security architecture that you're, you're trying to build? You are right to say that is a new security architecture to for the region and in, in large for Asia and Pacific. As the situation develops so fast, 
and sometimes unpredictable. And as the whole nation in South Asia and Asia and South Pacific are engaging themselves in the globalization and integration, so Vietnam think that the finance minister, economist uh, are working together. Why not the defense minister? And uh, with these people are sitting together discussing and reaching agreement, or at least that they discuss among themselves. It should be a great contribution to the situation in the region. Because of that, we proposed and agreed by the Asia states, and it's good that we can be in the first meeting of Defense Minister in Vietnam. And I think the minister, defense minister of the country, participating in the conference, were happy with the result of the meeting. And as I mentioned that, while all these countries, the ASEAN countries and plus eight countries, are working together for the security, for the economic development, for the veterans of education or labor forces, they all need to have the defense minister there to talk about what they should secure. The, the military people should secure the idea, the goal of the region and the participants of the uh, I, was, I was happy to see uh, our Secretary of Defense, uh, Secretary Gates, agreed to come very early, I think, and, and he mm -hmm. was uh, happy to come to, to Vietnam. Do you think that um, one of the outcomes of the uh, ASEAN Defense Ministers meeting plus was that they would meet every three years? Is that often enough? I was surprised that it wasn't going to be an annual meeting. I was surprised to, to, to learn that mm -hmm. the meeting will take place every three years. Right. Uh, I was not in the meeting, I was not in discussion of all these ministers. But I personally think that it is should be because we are going to have the annual summit, East, East Asia, Asia summit. summit yeah. We are going to have the annual summit with US, China, Russia, India, Japan, Korea, that's ASEAN plus one. And ASEAN plus three with Korea, Japan, and China. So I think the defense minister also should have the annual meeting. It's better be because there are a lot of things happening here and there in the region, in Asia, in Pacific. If something happened that we need the idea or discussion of the defense minister and had to wait for another three years, it's too long to wait. It was better to have an annual meeting. But I think the ministers there, they discussed and they came up to that kind of consensus that making it every three years of meeting. And I think in the process from now until 2014 or 13, there's something that uh, requires the meeting of the defense minister. I hope they will meet, not waiting for three years as they agreed. You talked about the ASEAN 10 plus the eight uh, that are part of the um, ADMM plus. Yeah. Those are the same eight countries that comprise the East Asia Summit, and Vietnam chaired the East Asia, Asia, East Asia Summit this year also. Why is the East Asia Summit important? Uh, to Vietnam, and, and what did you, uh, what does Vietnam think about the process going forward? Uh, probably speaking, we want us and strong. We want us and developed. But with current situation, no one can stand up alone to develop his own country, his own society. And the same with 
ASEAN. ASEAN is linked to the region, to the whole world. So if ASEAN want to be strong, both politically and economically, they need to cooperate with the neighboring countries and with the countries concerned. That's why we think East Asia is very good architecture that the relevant countries should meet together because we have the dialogue with this country in the region. So they need to be there, they need to discuss the East Asia situation, East Asia security and stability, East Asia economic cooperation. And if that, let's say, block, yeah. be strong, ASEAN will be strong. Yes. Yes. So I think that <coughs> that's, that's the idea and push by the ASEAN country. But does the, um, do you see competition, <coughs> sort of competing architectures taking place here? Mm -hmm. On the one hand, there's the East Asia Summit. As you mentioned, there's also the ASEAN Plus Three. And some analysts suggest that um, you know, maybe some countries in the Northeast Asia might prefer the ASEAN Plus Three uh, because it's got a very robust agenda. And the East Asia Summit is relatively <coughs> new. I think it's five years old. Well, ASEAN wants to, t to cooperate and work together with the architecture 10 plus 3. But it's not enough for us. It's not enough. We need to get other people to, to be involved in the region mm -hmm. because with Russia, India, Australia, New Zealand, US, that's why as the chair we proposed and agreed upon by ASEAN, we have invited US and Russia to be the full participant of this Asia summit. The, um, turning to U.S.-Vietnam relations, we, we just celebrated 15 <coughs> years of, of diplomatic relations. You were there? I was, I was there. I was there for the um, 1,000th anniversary of oh. Hanoi. <laughs> and I saw the parades. It was, it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. But um, in terms of the U.S.-Vietnam <coughs> relationship, um, 15 years, we've done pretty well together. Uh, I wanted to, to get your comment on that. Where do you think the relationship is, is, is headed in the future, uh, the U.S.-Vietnam relationship? Uh, it's only 15 years, but I think our two sides have, have made a long step in promotion of bilateral relations. And we both, I mean, the administration, the people are happy with the achievement we recorded in the last 15 years. We have deepened our mutual trust, mutual confidence. We have continuously furthered the bilateral relations in economic and technology, technology military security. So I think there's no reason why we are not going to have a much better relation in the next 15 years. Could you see the two countries normalizing military to military <coughs> relations in the, in the near future? We are trying to do that. And I think the U.S. is going to do that. But normalization is a long process. We normalized our diplomatic relation in 1995, and we worked hard, and we can see where it is now and how it is now. Yes. For the military cooperation and normalization, I think it takes some time. We both want to intensify the military cooperation, and. I think the other people look at our military cooperation and they will feel happily that, okay, these two guys, U.S. and Vietnam, are working hard to intensify their military cooperation for their own benefits and also for the benefits of the region. Yes.
you know, when you, when you talk about security in Asia, um, <coughs> you have to think about the, uh, the South China Sea. Uh, it's, it's obviously been an issue that's in the, in the papers of late. Um, what's Vietnam's perspective on, on a rising China and, and some, of the, some of the tension that you've seen in, in the South China Sea? And um, do you think the architecture that we've been discussing will be helpful in resolving those tensions? South China Sea is the, uh, very good in this. it might be a little bit headache for the people concerned. I mean, the, the regional countries and those outside of the, of the region. But for the South China Sea issue, we have to make clear that there are three, at least three, issues that we have to see. First one is the security and stability and peace in the whole region, South Asia and East Asia and Pacific. This issue or this problem, let me say, is the concern of everyone in the region and even in the world. Because a lot of people going through here, a lot of people having relations with the country in the region, nearing to bordering the South China Sea. So everyone is concerned about that. Everyone is interested in following the development in the region. So I say that it is a global or in that regional problem that people concerned have to take care of. The second issue is the maritime security. It's crucial for the development, it's crucial for the security in this region. And it for most concern the country having the interest in seeing the security maintained for the maritime in this region. A third issue that is territorial dispute. It is not relating to other countries, it is relating to the remnants of the region. This island, there's the water in this region. I think this this kind of issue has to be sought on the basis of international law and international practice that the international community accept. And no one wants war, no one wants to have conflict, hard conflicts there. And that is relating to the concerned countries, but of course the concerned country also expect that the outsiders, the, it means not the claimants of, of the issue, yeah. can render the system support, encouraging the claimants to talk together, mm. to negotiate, trying to find out a good solution that is acceptable to the direct claimants. So I understand that um, ASEAN and China have agreed to meet in December, I think December 22 and 23 in China, um, to talk about sort of implementing regulations on the declaration of a code of conduct in the South China Sea. Is that your understanding and do you do you think there, that China may have, uh, have be evolving its position on, on this issue? Uh, the kind of conduct was first proposed by the ASEAN back to 2001. Okay. I was the one who worked on, <laughs> on that. But because of the different reasons, because of the different idea from China and ASEAN, we downgraded it from COC mm -hmm. to DOC. I see. But in thinking of the ASEAN country, we always want to push the DOC 
to the stage where there are principle and regulation binding the ASEAN country in China, that is code of conduct. And I was pleased to hear that uh, the ASEAN and China <coughs> agree to start talking about that. Thus, they just come back to where we were in 2001. We discussed about CLC, but finally we got the DLC. Now we've got a DLC, we are going to talk about the CLC. Hopefully, we, the ASEAN and China will reach to, near to the code of conduct. It will be not fast. It, it will take some time. We've already had nine years ahead, I guess. Yeah. So you think it'll take <coughs> some more time to, to come to agreement? Now, if we start talking about COC, I don't think it will take for nine years because from the proposal of COC and we get to DOC, it takes about two years. Mm -hmm. right, two years. So, if the ASEAN country, I think, all want to have the principal regulation provided and binding and directing all the activities of the countries in in the region, relating to South China Sea, the islands, power. But <coughs> if China share the same idea, I think we will not have to wait for nine years. Right. Well, that would be that would be a welcome development. Yeah. <coughs> you know, Hillary Clinton, our Secretary of, of um, State, has been in, in Vietnam twice. Uh, this year, I believe, uh, and at the, at the ASEAN Regional Forum, she, she spoke out about these issues that you're talking about and said that the Americans are interested in, in, uh, in a resolution based on a multilateral approach and mm -hmm. rule of international law. Were Secretary Clinton's comments helpful uh, to, to ASEAN in that, in that situation? Uh, what uh, the Secretary commanded is in line with the ASEAN idea and ASEAN view that everything had to be settled reasonably in accordance with international law and practice. It, in, in one way or another, encouraged the negotiation spirits in the region, and it, I think, more or less, it helped. Well, last question, um, and I appreciate you taking the time. You've been ambassador here for, I guess, now almost three over, years. over three years. Over three years. Yes. What, um, what, what major accomplishment would you like to see finished before you, uh, before you wrap up your term as, as ambassador in the United States, whenever that may be? To be more concrete, uh, I've been here for three years and ten days. <laughs> okay, not that you're counting. Yeah, yeah, because I arrived on the 6th of November. Oh, okay. Today is the 16th of November, it's exactly two, three years and ten days. And I'm happy to see that <clears throat> looking back in three years, I'm so pleased to see the development of my light relations. Um, it's not a mu much, but I have personally contributed a little bit there for the development. When I arrived, I promised to myself that I have to make U.S. the number one foreign investor in Vietnam. It was last year, 2009. This year, I'm not sure, but may, may not be the number one. And now U.S. ranking about fifth or sixth. In overall? Yeah, investment. in overall. So I'm pretty sure that number one will come sometime, maybe after I leave. I know when I leave because my government has informed me that it will take me back or stay, still leave me here. Another thing I'm happy with that is education. It's great. 
a lot of activities relating to educational cooperation between the two countries has taken place. Many if colleges, university of U.S. are going to Vietnam, thinking of ways to cooperate with university, colleges, cooperate with the government of Vietnam on education. And that's good. And when I arrived, it was only 6,000 Vietnamese students. Now it is over 13,000. That's great. So you more than doubled the number? More than doubled in three years. It's great. And I understand the Vietnamese students are the largest of ASEAN countries. Vietnam is the has the largest student population in the United States. Yeah, I think it's, it is. It is. Great. But it is only one over one tenth of Chinese students community. Mm -hmm. China is about 127,000. Wow. That's the biggest. And uh, another thing I also have to say that Vietnam and the U.S. are trying to join together in economic development, a pack which you are going to host next year in Hawaii, the TPP, that we both are negotiating with the other eight countries, no, seven countries, including me, uh, Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And my president declared the 12 that in Japan that Vietnam will be official member of TPP. What, um, what I want to see when I finish my term is that economic, military, security, education cooperation continue to be promoted. It might be faster if we don't have the differences. Mm. We have some number of things that differ from each other. That's why I hope that at the time to come whether I'm still here or I have been living, we try to tackle and solve the differences that exist in between our relations. But we had to be practical that some of the differences takes time sure. to be solved. But the, the more we solve, the better for the relations. Ambassador, thank you so much for, for coming today. That's a great, it's a great goal, and I think all of us hope we can help you uh, help you and, and help our government achieve those goals. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thanks, CSIS. Thank you.